On Friday, September 24th, the leaders of the Quad countries had their first physical meetings. These are the leaders of the United States, Australia, Japan and India. A lot of issues were discussed. They released a joint statement. This has a lot of implications for the region itself. We'll be talking about all this on Mapping Fault Lines. Joined by Praveer Prakash sir. Praveer, so let's first take a look at the joint statement released by the Quad countries. They, you know, talked about a lot of issues, of course. But one of the key aspects seems to be this focus on freedom of navigation, rules-based order in the Indo-Pacific region. Now we talked about this before as well. But again, what does the reiteration of this point by these countries really signify? You know, it's an interesting proposition of the rule-based international order, which India is now uh, subscribing to, because who creates the rules is the real issue. And we had, post the Second World War, the United Nations, the Security Council, which is supposed to be in accordance with international law, they will decide what is law, lawful and what is not. Suddenly, we have a quote-unquote ex-colonial powers who have now arrogated themselves the right to decide what should be the quote-unquote international rules, which India is now subscribing to in violation with the long-held principles of the Indian government that these should be according to the United Nations, international law, and that is the body. United Nations and Security Council is the body which will arrogate what the rules of conduct for nations can be. Now, there are problems of that. It's not that there isn't. But the solution is that some countries will become the arbiter of these rules, the international, what should be the international rules of conduct of nations, is hearkening back to essentially a colonial era where a few of the colonial countries decided what are the international, so-called international rules, which meant they could ride roughshod over a large number of countries. It's interesting, the United States, which has launched the largest number of attacks on the other countries post Second World War, is the leader of this international rule-based order and is telling everybody what the rules should be. Now, if you look at all the conduct that the United States had had, even recently, whether it is marching into Afghanistan without the United Nations Security Council uh, umbrella, or the Iraq war, what is called the coalition of the willing, again, outside the United Nations framework completely. All of this show that the US does not abide by international law. There also have been, as we know, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, its interventions, military intervention in Latin America in different parts of Latin America and the Caribbeans. Now, all of that take, taken together, if we see the Quad's pronouncements, I'm not surprised by Australia, Japan, that is taken for granted. But India's now joining this kind of formulations seems to be that we are not really sticking by what should be and what would be called a relatively autonomous position where India looks at its own interest internationally and then decides how to align with on what issues. This seems to be signing on the dotted line. You talk about freedom of navigations and it's really about South China Sea. Now, South China Sea will be talked about as in the Pacific, but it is the near littoral states, which are basically Philippines, Vietnam, uh, other countries of that region and China who have certain conflicts about what are the territorial waters, what are the economic zones of each of these countries. But none of them subscribe to freedom of navigation as defined by the United States, that they have the right to go wherever their warships want. That's not their position. In fact, they will say it's our territorial sea or it's our economic zone, and it is not freedom of navigation, which assumes it's open seas. So there is even there, the formulation that the Quad is making is gratuitous as far as these countries are concerned, and these countries are already on record, the very weakly, saying that we don't really agree with this freedom of navigation formulations that are being made by the United States. And of course, it's uh, various uh, 
camp followers, which I can understand Australia, Japan, and so on. But India, again, joining in that, particularly on the freedom of navigation issue, when we have seen in Lakadives what the United States Navy has done. They don't recognize what we consider our territorial waters or our economic zones. So all of this raises a lot of flags. And again, the understanding that I have is that this does not seem to have taken place with a thorough understanding of where India should be coming from and what its independent or autonomous if international positioning should be. And here, subscribing to the dotted line of the Quad in this form doesn't make sense for India. Particularly when you look at, as you can see, the Indo-Pacific. India is not a player in the Pacific. It doesn't have a Pacific, right. <laughs> shall we say, littoral uh, position. So it's really about the Indian Ocean. And Indian Ocean, in that sense, is not in play as far as China is concerned. It, when you talk about Indo-Pacific, we are really talking about Southeast Asia. And Southeast Asia, if you see, this is the region which is economically developing the fastest in the world today, if you take economies of different regions. And therefore, this region is in play. Because at the moment, whether the, that market will belong to whom, that's also the battle. And it's very clear, China has a very strong trading position, both in terms of buying and selling goods. And this is also true for Japan and South Korea, the allies of the United States. So given the economic relationships that, that are there, it's very difficult to see how those countries will move easily towards the United States. Australia is an outlier here because they have got themselves into a spat with China recently. Two years, their relationships have been pretty bad. And Australia, of course, if you look at, again, the map, you will see Southeast Asia's proximity is Australia. Therefore, Australia has a military position which can, if Southeast Asia is in militarily in play, can have the salience. Again, of course, whether uh, the military power has any bearing in today's world is a different issue. But the Australian, at least, there is a logic of what they are doing by saying that, you know, this is where we want to be, and we will align completely with the United States against China. Question is... Why is India doing it? Why is India doing it? Second question is, is a military attack on China feasible? Is it a military play that we are seeing? How does such a military play? impinge on what are essentially economic relationships which are developing in Southeast Asia and East Asia, that's a big question. And I think what the United States and its allies, as I said, India, open question, why we are joining all of that, why we're not keeping our relative autonomy vis-a-vis -vis this, but why is it in, why are these countries trying to encircle Southeast Asia militarily against China. This I have not really understood because it seems to be getting back to prehistoric, I will say by today's terms, prehistoric days where you could do gunboat diplomacy and through gunboats and submarines coerce neighbors and coerce other countries, you know, do force projection at a distance and oceans were the uh, places through which you could do the force projections. And if you can see, U.S. is quite at a distance. Guam is the nearest base to uh, East a Asia, just as it would take the Diego Garcia. It's, a, it's yes, there is a base there. But these are not in play. So therefore, Australia becomes important. But Australia is looked upon as a colonial power in Southeast Asia. The record has not been very clean. Neither the they are really liked over there. So if you take the Australia, UK, US relationships, it seems to be hearkening back to Anglo-Saxon dominance and again is not in consonance even with the Quad. We don't know, is the Quad the stepbrother of the, uh, the, the this, a, Australia, UK, US alliance? Who is the stepson and who is the real son? It's not clear at the moment, but there seems to be some dissonance between the two. It's interesting, Prabir, you mentioned these points because uh, the AUKUS also was mentioned yesterday by Scott Morrison, who kind of indicated that there was some kind of complementary relationship, of course, not expanding it. Now, one of the aspects of the AUKUS alliance is that the submarines which Australia is supposed to get are going to come much, much later. So there really is a question in terms of what is uh, the benefit for all of these players, because we know that 
already we have a lot of military bases as far as the United States is concerned in the region and it's the area is full dotted completely West Asia of course but also this region so are we looking at a kind of encirclement the policy that is trying to come into shape with the help of Australia or is there something else? You know, if we look at the bases, you will find they're concentrated in West Asia. They're not concentrated in Southeast Asia or on East, in East, East Asia. There are bases, East Asia, in terms of uh, Taiwan, Japan, as well as uh, South Korea. Taiwan is a protectorate. It really doesn't have bases, but ships and Aircraft regularly are now visiting Taiwan, uh, basically saying that they would like to keep give it quote unquote protection without mentioning is it a part of one China or two China policy. Officially, United States still talks about one China policy, but the way they are uh, behaving is very clear. They would like Taiwan at some point to give declare its independence, recognize it, and put up bases over there. The question that arises is that if Southeast Asia is mainly in play, not so much East Asia. Then are, do they have bases? And you will find there aren't many bases over there. In fact, most of the countries have refused to provide bases to them. So even the existing bases, which for instance existed in Philippines, no longer exist there. Given that, what is the United States wanting to do? Because if that area they want to deny to China militarily, then Australia becomes a player. So it has been articulated by various experts and even foreign policy, which is a fairly uh, very pro-State Department or has very close links to the State Department. They have said that this, in fact, is Australia willing to have submarines, ships, Tomahawk missiles and aircraft posted in Australia. So it seems that the first stage of the AUK-US uh, alliance, of course, as you know, UK may still have delusions of past glory, but it's a bit player today in the world unless it uh, climbs onto the US in some form or the other. So because Australia has a position which is strategic, it seems that the submarines are only the uh, some sense the smoke screen yeah. through which Mr. Morrison wants to join the US bandwagon militarily. And therefore, we probably will see submarines, nuclear submarines, and we will see, for instance, aircrafts, bases, and so on provided to Australia. Australia willing to host them, which is the key issue. US always wants bases. It has 800 bases around the world. So it will add a few more in Australia. So force projection of the United States against China in Southeast Asia then could become relatively easier because Guam is still too far away. As far as Southeast Asia is concerned, it is not a player again. So South China Sea, as I said, is really about Southeast Asia. So that really doesn't matter. But when it comes to Australia, I think they have a position which is much closer. So it does seem it's a more of drawing Australia into its immediate military ambit. And that's the real meaning of the AUK-US uh, alliance. And therefore, it's more Australia willing to have the United States come and position itself in Australia. And the submarines are in that sense, uh, it's interesting because submarines Australia will have to pay for. So it provides bases and pays a high price for submarines which will be available only 20 years down the line, maybe 15, maybe 20 years down the line. So what it is buying is interesting because it seems to be buying American presence, making itself a target in any, any war that might take place in the future, and also promising to pay for protection. So is it that it is protection money Australia will pay to United States? for the privilege of hosting them in its bases in Australia, as well as also buying submarines in the future, long-term dependency. But of course, the other joker in the pack, which we haven't talked about, is the fact that it's a violation of various you know, in, uh, nuclear agreements that have been right. uh, agreed to by various players, so various countries. So the fact sure. that these are not low enriched uranium fuel that these submarines will use, but highly enriched uranium fuel that these uh, sub, the submarines that the United States is offering will use, means it is basically weapons-grade uranium. And weapons-grade uranium is transferred to a non-nuclear weapons 
country, as declared in the NPT and the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. These are all violations of the existing international, uh, existing atomic energy regulations and rules that have been framed. And they violate also IAEA regulations. So this is a declaration. Australia is now being given the quasi-formal position of being a, being a nuclear state, just as India was also given this position. So effectively, the United States seems to be inducting, with UK help, another country into its nuclear, uh, you know, larger orbit, by which it also declares itself a nuclear state. So even though this is not being stated, the implications of this seem to be Given the fact it's a highly enriched uranium, weapons-grade uranium seems to be that. And that's a big, big question that the world has to place. Because if that loophole, we always knew this loophole existed in the nuclear agreements that the world has signed. The question is that if this is the loophole Australia is allowed to use, why can't, for instance, other countries use it? If, for instance, Iran says, OK, we are going to develop a highly enriched uranium uh, submarine, nuclear submarine, what is the pro proposition then that the US will have? So creating holes in nuclear agreements of this kind, if the US is serious about just non-proliferation, forget about you know, the comprehensively getting rid of all nuclear weapons, which is what the non nuclear non-proliferation treaty had actually said. Yeah. If that is not the goal, then creating such a big hole through which you can drive a submarine, a nuclear submarine, also means you can also drive, therefore, violation of all the nuclear agreements. So I think that's the big question. It may appear to be a small one at the moment, mm -hmm. but the way this loophole has been created means can other countries also exploit this loophole? And that's a big question for the world because, you know, having nuclear weapons itself is a threat. Having more countries have nuclear weapons is simply multiplying the threat, threat really exponentially. And I'm really worried that all of this, which this narrow aim of containing China militarily, strategically, and economically, can blow up in the world for everybody's face. And that is the threat, really, of the AUK US policies, which are now embedded or being also somewhat sanctified by the court. Absolutely. Thank you, Prabhu. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching News Click.